Looking forward to that as well. Right. And another another date to throw out at you. What is it? When does uh, Lucky Louie come out DVD? Lucky Louie DVD is on sale January 30th. Oh, Ooh. January 30th. Okay. Yeah, you different. can order them now. You can on all the Amazon and all that. You can pre-order them, but it goes on sale officially January 30th. Okay. It was a, it was a fine show. It was a good show. Still don't understand why that was canceled. Yeah, it just. I uh, guess you guys are figure, trying to figure that out as well. Yeah. yeah. If it was for ratings and people didn't just hate it, like didn't watch it, I would be like, it would be, be a lot fine. easier to take. Yeah. Yeah, it would be fine because I've done a lot of stuff like that where people just didn't get it, but, but this was uh, popular. People really dug it. Everywhere I go, people say stuff about it, yell at me in the streets and everything. And uh, yeah, no, the ratings went up every week. They were higher than the previous week. Right. And when they gathered all the ratings for the whole week, like mm -hmm. the, the that's the real ratings. I HBO. Like most people don't watch a show when it's on. They yeah. watch it when it reruns or on TiVo. And by that, we were beating Deadwood every week. And we were very competitive. We were a good show, uh, ratings wise. Yeah, um, so it's not the ratings. No, it's so not. And it's, the people that yeah, I what is for, it? the chairman of HBO, the president of HBO Entertainment, both loved the show. Went on, like, used to call me during the summer to say, hang in there. We we think the show's hilarious. Oh, God. And then one day they just said, sorry. They both were like, sorry, but we can't do it. Which to me says that there's somebody, you know, a parent company, Warner Brothers person who, yeah, some guy in a golf sweater. Uh, uh, get rid of it. Hurrah, hurrah, I don't know what it is. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. We can cut some corners. Hurrah. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Just get rid of it. But if we sell a stupid amount of DVDs, then uh, we have a shot. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's well, see. that starts it's, January it's 30th. Happened. January 30th. Yeah. All right. Let's get back. It's on the walls <laughs> and like African oh, furniture. You know and when we did Lucky Louie and we had to design, there's a black couple that yeah, across yeah, the hall from the us. Or, yeah, so the, the set designers built their apartment for, for us and I went down to approve it. And it had all this African art. And I said, why do you have to, every show that every has black show, people man. has to have African art. And I got mad and I said, take it out because it, it, it's just stereotypical. It's just a guy. They're like, but it's a black family. So what? Take it out. He's just a guy from Newark. So they took it out. And then it kept getting back in. Like every new oh wave God. of design would bring in. And I fought really hard to get it out of there. And then when Jerry Miner and, and uh, uh, Kim Hawthorne, who played the couple, walked into the apartment for the first time, they looked around and said, where's all the African stuff? <laughs> <laughs> How come there's no African uh, stuff? I just picture. <laughs> I thought I was doing this really great liberal thing. Yeah. Oh, my God. So apparently you're wrong. You're like totally off, wrong. Totally off the mark. The Every, black people like, got to have African stuff. We're a black couple. This just goes to show you. You know, Rick, Rick uh, opened for me in Tempe, Arizona at the Improv, and he had never really worked a legitimate comedy club on the road before. <laughs> really? And they had him MC, which is cra it makes no sense. <laughs> like, say hello to the crowd. And the first show, some magic happened, and people, these people from Tempe, you know, wow, they, yeah. they, they, they dug him. Yeah. And then the next night, it was a complete disaster. Oh, shit. And the owner of the club came and said, I can't, I can't have him on this show. <laughs> and he got fired after the second show, but they kept him on to do like five minute sets in the middle. And then the next week, he was supposed to come to LA to, to, to test for Lucky Louie. I hadn't told him yet, I don't think that he was testing. And I was seriously considering not having him test. Wow. Because I thought Pitch. he just got fired from Tempe. <laughs> he's going to come out to LA. They're never going to give him this part. And after those two things together, that's just too much. It's going to be too much failure like i don't think i can do this to him yeah but then i realized if he ever knew that i would take a gig away from him out of pity that you know <laughs> yeah. take a shot away from him and so i had him come out and test an hbo and I, I put him in the middle of three guys and i thought maybe there's a miracle that they'll like <laughs> get him. lost in there and yeah, take everyone and maybe they won't get mad at me for bringing him in but <laughs> hbo they, he <laughs> left the, the three guys left the room and they said how do you not hire rick shapiro why did you bring anybody else that guy's amazing wow. they fell in love with him immediately well, Hey, cool. You were great on Lucky yep. Louie, Rick. Yeah, he it, was. It was also Louis. great when he calls me for the call back. He always had to uh, tw twist his thumb. He says, I just want you to know you're going in with a guy who already has the, the, the part. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, I'm riding next to this scrawny cat, carrot top. Looking yeah. like an easy, John Glazer. Yeah. He's probably great. He, he was cool, actually. But, yeah, he was a nice guy. But, but, uh, but, but I was like, oh, they're going for a big red-haired guy, giant red hair, right, giant... Yeah. So I said, well, I can do whatever I want in this interview. I I, I ain't get getting this. <laughs> <laughs> I almost I'm, I'm, felt no pressure either. It was like you knew you weren't going to get hired. So me yeah. and Rick, yeah. it was me and Rick, not for the same part, but me, Rick, Nick DiPaolo. Yeah, it was yeah. great to be in the room with and you guys. You had your friends out there, so like none of us are going to get this. Yeah. And then yeah. me and Nick are on our way to the airport, and Louis calls me. Oh, that was awful. What? Me and Nick DiPaolo. I called oh, I call no. him to tell him he got the part. And, and, he's he, with and Nick. then he says, Nick's right here, and he hands Nick the phone. Uh, 
Rick, Nick. No, Louis said to me at first, me and Nick at the Oh yeah, mistake, yeah. Just to celebrate the fact that we at least tested for HBO. We both felt it went well. Driving back to the airport because we were both flying back to New York. So we're sitting there and Louis calls me. He goes, uh, uh, he goes, uh, sorry, man, you didn't get it. He goes, you did great. They liked you. But uh, we may have something for you in the future. And I'm like, all right, man. Hey, look, oh, I appreciate you sending me out for it. It was what cool. A prick. <laughs> it, it was really yeah. cool that you did that. I appreciate it. And then he goes, nah, I'm kidding. You got it. I'm like, what? Yeah. Wow. I was a little more artful than that. Yeah, yeah, I said, yeah. Look, you did the best you could. As he said, it was an excellent audition. It you wasn't. Suck. You know, it's a You're tough a thing. Dick. It's a tough thing to come out here and audition like this for those guys. And I think you did a great job. And and at least be consoled by the fact that you got the job. Like that's. Yeah. Oh, you're such. Oh, he was like, dick. what? Yeah, but then he gives the phone to Nick, and Nick was here the whole thing. Yes. Nick is right there. So Nick thinks I'm going to do the same thing to him. So, yeah, Nick is, so, I had oh. to just, so I had to just blurt out, Nick, you didn't get it, and I'm not kidding, you did not get the part, oh. and I'm sorry. I did yes. what I could, but you Me didn't get it. Nick had such a sad drive back. Yeah. But Nick ended there. up being on the show as a super. He was great. He was great. He fucking great. So, yep. So who got Nick's uh, gig? Uh, Mike, Mike Haggerty, who was Mike, really yep. very good. Yep. Yep. Yeah, uh, but you, you did damn, it worse than me. I know. You, you, you did it like my mo it. Mo mother. I'm sitting in this. I never go to the Montrose <laughs> Sweetie chocolate strawberries in a robe. I'm sitting in an expensive <laughs> robe in this silk curtain room, and he sit, sit, sit down. I'm sitting on the bed. I'm like rubbing my head, and he goes. Just go back. Like it could have been my mother. The way he said it. Just go back, knowing you did a damn good job. <laughs> and I was like, and I was, I was like gonna cry. I was yeah. like, and then I said, "You got it." Yeah, I love that. I love uh, giving people good news. Fucking Alan Funt. What do you, what do you think you are? <laughs> exactly. You're on. I did it to camera. every single. I did it to every single person that we hired. <laughs> Fucked with every single one of them. Uh, all right, we got. Please to, uh, call the other guys and went. Congratulations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. Going home. That would be the game. Um, yeah. That would Unfortunately, be the you got the call from HBO, and they weren't kidding either. Yeah, no, oh. they weren't kidding at all. <laughs> oh, Bastards. Oh, oh. No. No, that's what, when oh, I got that you, call. Are you joking? No, the woman that called me did the same, tried to put me out. Because she called me, and I thought her calling meant I got it. Oh. And she, I got another season. And she called and said, hey, Louie. And I go, hey. And she goes, this is not a good call. This is not oh, a good right call. Right away, she, she said, this is a bad yeah. call. I go, yeah. But they continue like, to show oh, the right. fucking oh, show on HBO. Oh, that that, don't make, that doesn't make sense. So they can yeah. sell their DVDs. Yep. Oh, People no. like it. loved it, too, man. Carolyn was a yeah. big Carolyn loved it. Chris Albrecht loved it. And then he went away. No, this is a bad call. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. oh, that's oh, horrible. Worst moment of my life. Oh, that's like horrible. horrible. Worst moment of my life to date. All right, yeah. we're going to read it. A big part of that is from TV. When yeah. you grow up, you go, my family's not as happy as the Brady yeah. Bunch or the Waltons or something. And then a show come on HBO called Lucky Louie yeah. that really showed a family who, you know, talked the way you did. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, people got a little bit upset about it. Yep. Uh, and I was watching The View uh, when you were a guest on The View and Barbara Walters, before she brung you out, basically called you the Antichrist. Yeah. Then brought you out with the ladies. Yep. That was an amazing day. <laughs> yes. And all those women raised kids, right? At some point, I, guess, I think. I guess. I don't know. I don't know that they did. Yeah. Those girls. Uh, some, uh, well, I think about half of them did. Or, yeah. But why do you think. Was she being like, okay, I'm above it? Or do you really think that she was appalled? By the way, you were showing family life. Well, it was weird because uh, when Lucky Louie was coming out and I was promoting it, I asked to do The View because I'd been on before on Joy Behar's Joy's Com Comedy Corner. Sure. And uh, they had asked me to do it the first time and I said, no, that's not my audience. They're not going to like me. That's not my audience. They're old ladies. And uh, the dude, the producer, I remember he just said, uh, well, what do you, what, you live in New York City. What are you doing tomorrow at one? Like, are you that busy? You can't just <laughs> take a town car here and be on television. And I was like, oh, that's true, I could do that. So I just showed up, and Joy Behar is an old friend of mine, I know her, so I'm sitting with her, and I was killing, it was one of the best TV sets I'd ever had. Because the audience at The View is just, in, they're just there to have fun, they're right. just positive. So uh, when I started promoting Lucky Louie, I, I asked, I said, get me on The View, I want to be on that show. And also because to me, that's part of the audience for Lucky Louie. And everywhere I go, by the way, old ladies come up to me and say how much they love the show. That's like one of the biggest demographics who likes the show. Because <laughs> they're just, oh, you bad boy. Like, they just like, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so I said, get me on. And they got me on. And I got a call from the producer who said, uh, oh, the ladies love you. And they're excited to have you here. And they all have all watched the show. Like, they, they, it's going to be great. And they gave me funny stories. They asked me to, to give them funny stories. 
to tell on the on panel, and they were going to prompt me for funny stories. So I gave them all my funny stories, and then I showed up, and uh, uh, the other guest was uh, Fonzie, um, <laughs> Henry Winkler. And I mean, for me, it was just being there, I was like Barbara Walters. I grew up, and she was like Barbara Wawa, and she was, uh, you know, the center of so much uh, going on, and Arafat, and all this stuff, you know. And then Fonzie. I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was in, uh, you know, like fourth grade, third grade, when Fonzie was just the, uh, the fucking king of the world to me. So here he is, you know, weird, not at all Fonzie. Uh, you know, hi. Yeah. You know, it's not Fonzie. Like, oh, hi. Oh, that's nice. Like, it's not how Fonzie talks. And... Uh, but he's a great guy, yeah. and he knows uh, Pamela Adlon, who played my wife on Lucky Louie. So he actually came over to my dressing room to say, oh, I love Pamela, and I love the show. It's dear. Your show is dear. That's what he said. It's so dear. And I, and I was so, that was great. And then, and then, uh, and then I'm, uh, all of a sudden, a producer comes in my room and says, I have to talk to you. Uh, the word, they're about to go in the air. You need to see this. And her, her hand was shaking on this remote. She turned on the, the TV. On my, this is li- it's on live. And, and there's Barb Walters saying, uh, um, our first topic is about uh, one of our guests uh, who has a show called Lucky Louie. And uh, this is the, the most offensive, racist, <laughs> sexist, terrible show I've ever seen in my life. I can't believe this is on the air. I hate it. And they all started going to town on that there's pictures of me and stuff. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> and uh, I got to go out there. Yeah. And uh, so she said, I, so we still want to try to do your funny stories. I'm like, no, I can't do the funny <laughs> stories. You're fucking killing me out there. And I was shaking. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle it. I think I called Chris Rock. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's like an advisor to me? And <laughs> I told him backstage. What I was backstage, and I called Chris Rock and this said, "This was the best show ever, by the way." Yeah, it was a great. <laughs> and I said, "I don't know what to do. These women just shit all over me, and uh, and uh, they, they're, I'm about to go out there." And he said, uh, "Don't def- forget the women. You've got people who are watching on at home. Mm-hmm. Just uh, just rise above it and uh, talk to the audience." Fuck Barb Walters. She doesn't matter. You're going to be on television right now. Nobody's even going to notice what show it is. It's just going to see you. And that was a, a wake me up. I went out there and, and I thought, I'm not talking to Barbara Walters. Her audience is more important than she is to me. <laughs> and, uh, and I love those ladies. And I know they'll like me. And, uh, and also, they showed a clip, right before they brought me out, they showed a clip from the show of me and my wife arguing about money in bed. Which is, to me, what marriage is. <laughs> arguing about money instead of fucking. <laughs> and... Um, and the clip really worked. And the audience laughed and I thought, fuck her, I don't need her. And I went out there and she made a big deal out of, Barb Waltz came over and hugged me when I first walked out. Like, oh, uh, we're friends now. Like, oh, the rift is over. And when she did that, I realized this is pure bullshit. She doesn't m- dislike the show. She wasn't offended. She's trying to get on the map. She's trying to make it into something. And also the Republican, to, oh, I forget her name, <laughs> on the other side, said something about the, the, uh, this show has touched off a firestorm of controversy. We were on the air for like a week. It hadn't touched off anything. <laughs> there was nothing. They were trying to, let's touch off this firestorm of controversy right now. So uh, it just, then I realized that it's all false. Nobody was really mad at me. And then I just explained the show to the, audi- to the audience. I knew they wanted me to come out and go, fuck you. That's what they wanted. That's right. why they sandbagged me because they hoped I would misbehave. They thought I would come on and say, fuck yeah. you, you old bag. And she'd go, oh my goodness. And it would be all over the place. <laughs> but instead I came out and said, listen, I, I thank you for bringing up these concerns because <laughs> I, I don't want people to think the show's here to offend anyone. It's just honest. And I went through the points of the show and why why it was important to me. The funniest... Well, it was a totally different um, uh, experiment. Lucky Louie was a performed stories TV show. And I, 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 I was inspired by things like All in the Family and The Honeymooners doing a show in front of an audience. But I think that the American diet of uh, multi-camera shows has been so fouled by all the other shows. I mean, for years... People have watched fake laughter on very beautiful sets and just Harvard-written jokes. And uh, so it's just that's what they're used to. When they saw my show, they were like, this is just a piece of shit. Uh, and it maybe was a piece of shit. 
but I think it was hard for people to take because of the context of the other sitcoms. Um, it's hard for people. A lot of people still believe it was a laugh track. Um, I've had debates with people where they say, "Why did you put in fake laughs on your show?" I'm like, "No, there was an audience right there, and they laughed, and we and we recorded it." And they said, "Well, you should have told people that it was real." I said, "There's a, before every show. It said Lucky Louie was filmed before a live audience. They used to do that on Happy Days too, and all those shows because they were also getting the same shit. But nobody hears it. They just see what they see." Um, but anyway, it was, I learned one thing from Lucky Louie, which is not to have a room full of writers running my show. Uh, that's why this show, I didn't want to hire any writers, I didn't want directors, I just wanted to do it. Um, my daughter said to me, this one's going to be easier, because you don't have to convince ten people. You can just do it. And I like that better. That's just a personal thing. Writing rooms are terrific, um, I guess. Uh, <laughs> But ten perspectives or twelve writing one thing, I think that that I think it I think it over perfects comedy and it makes it not come from anywhere uh, in your gut. Uh, so that was the main thing I thought. I just want to do this myself. Just write the scripts and just let it, and also be willing to fail because getting a show, getting out there, and like I said, getting it canceled, I survived it. So I thought I'll, I'll do this the hard way again, uh, maybe even harder this time because if I fail, who gives a shit? It's not that bad. Yeah. Now, I, you know, I don't want to you know, just rush over Lucky Louie, but I, I think that what happened there, and we don't have to go into the politics of it, but I remember you dragging me. Well, not dragging me. I was always happy to see what you made. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You, you said, I want you to watch this pilot. So, I, you know, you, you had the show at CBS, which, was, was, which wasn't right. That was Louie. St. Louis was Saint the Louis, first right. pilot I did, yeah. Yeah, and that didn't go, but that made sense that it didn't go on some level. It wasn't oh, going to yeah. honor you anyways. And then Never you did happen. Lucky Louis, the, and then I remember you showed me the pilot, and, and the conceit of it was, once again, that it, it was very brilliant in the sense that you showed me this pilot, you explained to me you know, what it was. You said, mm -hmm. look, what we're doing is we're doing the Honeymooners. That, yeah. That's what we're doing. And the set is the Honeymooner set. It is yeah. stripped down. We're doing, you know, straight out, you know, 1950s, 1960s television yeah. where, where, you know, the action takes place in almost a, it, it was almost like a television like post vaudeville where you're dealing with almost play sets. Right. And, and that, that was your idea is that we're going to infuse a modern sensibility into a classic context. And, and that was the intellectual conceit of it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was like and nothing that anybody had ever seen. And the rawness was like nothing anyone had ever seen. And the conceit, I think, ultimately, w what happened was the conceit was lost. That, yeah. that, that the idea that we were doing the honeymooners and that there was something, you know, uh, an intellectual uh, approach to taking something, you know, classic right. and updating it. I think some people were like, you know, why didn't they make better sets? Yeah, that's what some people said. And right. I remember being on the phone with uh, Chris Albrecht, who ran HBO at the time, uh, and gave me the show. And he was laughing about reviews that said the sets are so poorly constructed. Right. And he said, why would we let that happen unless it was on purpose? Right. Like, do they really think that I'm reading? This is Chris Albrecht. Yeah. Yeah. Does this reviewer really think I'm reading this and going, oh, God, we really should have put more money? I mean, look at what we do. Look at fucking The Sopranos yeah. Yeah, and this yeah, heavy yeah. production they yeah. put in everything. Yeah. Why would we do that unless it was deliberate? Right. Um, the reason I did it that way, I wasn't trying to go back to Honeymooners so much as I was trying to scale back what had happened to sitcoms that hadn't helped them. Right. Because I hated every sitcom on the air. Right. Uh, even the good ones. Uh, whatever. Seinfeld, right. Friends, right. Frasier. Right. right. I hated them because I didn't feel like I was watching anything that was really happening or even being... They were all shot on film, and they were all... I, I, can't, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I could go on a long time. Um, but uh, I felt like the audience was being cheated by these shows. Yeah, And it wasn't only The Honeymooners. It was also uh, uh, All in the Family. Was, right. For me, the thing was... That it used to be guys like performers like Jackie uh, yeah. Gleason and yeah. and uh, uh, Car what's his name fucking uh, Carol Carol O'Connor yeah Carol O'Connor yeah were aware of their audience they were I remember seeing an interview with Jackie Gleason with a big long cigarette where he said you don't you know you can't do comedy without an audience because the audience tells you what to do the audience tells you if it's funny the audience tells you how long to sit with it the audience tells you. How to say it. Yeah. And it's true when you watch The Honeymooners that he was totally measured by the crowd as far as his rhythm and yeah. 
he would when he got his laughs, he would live inside those laughs by walking around. And right, right, yeah, of course, right. He, he milking would, it. He would milk like he would. Uh, you would hear a laugh yeah. dying. Yeah, and then he'd shoot a glance at the wife, and the laugh would explode right. upward. And I love that kind of work. To me, that is a beauty in playing an audience like an instrument. Now, when now let me. I, I don't know what the demise was, and you can tell me. And you know, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. Do you think because you're you're evolving into a, a very effective actor? Do you think at the time that you did Lucky Louie that you were stifled by your acting ability? Well, I, I, I didn't. I wish I'd done what Gleason did. You, you hear these stories that he never came to rehearsals. Yeah. Every cast member of that show that was ever interviewed tells that story. He didn't come to rehearsals. Every actor, every real TV actor really needs rehearsals in order to know what they're doing. Yeah. And he, everybody rehearsed without him. Mm-hmm. And then he would just come in and go, all right, what are we doing? And he'd know half his lines. Yeah. And he wouldn't know the blocking. Yeah. And they just learned how to work around that. I mean, they really were brilliant that they could do that. Yeah. Uh, they also recognized his, that he was the whole show. Yeah. And that even if he stumbled through a scene, he would save it. Yeah. And actually that stumbling yeah. is what made the scenes great because he knew he'd have to save it. Yeah. When you're given a script and a week of blocking and rehearsal and repetitive and over and over again, yeah. you just, all you got to do is do it. Yeah. It's, it kills the comedy. Yeah. But when you are given a fucking, when you put yourself on a high wire, I'm on a TV show. And back then, everybody on the planet Earth watched The Honeymooners. Yeah. It wasn't like right, right. those yeah. who like uh, HBO. It was like yeah, everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. watched. It was like 50 million people. Yeah. So he, in front of all those people, he'd be like, oh, okay, I could, you could see him in some scenes, like, I'm not sure where I am or what's supposed to happen in this scene. I'm just going to do this. Bwah! And he would just be hilarious. Yeah. I wish I'd done that, because I have better instincts as a, as a comedian than I do as an actor. And uh, we rehearsed like a motherfucker. We rewrote. We did everything I didn't want to do. When we started doing that show, I said... To Mike Royce, who was my partner, we're not going to have a writer's room full of writers who are perfecting the scripts and rewriting every little line and like going pouring over it on a big screen where everybody chimes in. Yeah. We're not going to punch up everything and change out the fucking punchlines every take. Yeah. And we're not going to have um, this thing where we block and rehear- all this stuff. But we did it, and it just eased towards that because we had a staff of writers and because that's how people know how to do it. Right. Um, if I could go back, I would have done it differently. I would have uh, s- centralized the writing more, and I would have uh, not rehearsed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> honestly, I would have let them rehearse. The thing that changed it though was Pamela, who played my wife. She was like a comedy team with me. That right. was a huge revelation for me to get laughs with a partner. Right, I had never, never done that before. That was a massive thing. right. So, and Pamela came from traditional television, and and she also said you know trust some of these people let them let them uh, help you yeah and i think that was smart but what was lucky louie was harder than this series i'm doing now it's just a huge amount of work and you what also was have the ultimate please... demise of it well a few things i think the reason it some people didn't like it is because what they had been fed in television had didn't prepare them well for it um they everyone thought it was a laugh track Everyone thought we put in fake laughs, and some people were really turned off by that. So in the same way they didn't understand the, 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 the context of the set, yeah, they the made sets assumptions. Were, the set was the set because I just didn't give a shit what the set looked like. Right. The idea was we're going to do go back to what, when these shows were funny because right. they hadn't been, to me, and, funny and in a long time. doing it in front of real audience without amplifying the laughter. Yeah, exactly. Putting right. an audience in front of the stage and letting their laughs be in the show. And, and people didn't know better. No, and actually... So it was the, lost the, on them. Yes, they just thought it was fake laughs right. and shitty sets right. and bad acting. Whereas it was we are holding for laughs, which uh, TV sitcoms are written by Harvard graduates who yeah. don't like audiences. Yeah. They don't like people. Yeah, they're not popular people. Right, and so they hate the idea that audiences can tell them whether something's funny or not. Right, so they've built a system where they shoot on a stage in front of an audience, but they ignore the audience. Right. And uh, they feed them pizza. There's only 10 of them left when they finish shooting. Most big sitcoms don't have an audience now. Right. And they have a man called the Laugh Man, and he puts in the laughs. Right. And the laughs are short enough yeah. that, the audio, that the clippy dialogue can continue. Right. You, Jennifer Aniston never looks aware of the audience when she's per- supposed to be performing in front of an audience yeah. on Friends. That's how old I am. Yeah. But uh, we had to hold for laughs, and 
it was a mess, but it yeah. was supposed to be. But most people thought, and we even had a thing like in Happy Days, Lucky Louie was taped before a live audience. Right. We said that before every yeah. uh, show. Yeah. And um, everyone would still say it's canned laughter. I even read something on a website where somebody said they should have told people that it was taped before a live audience. That yeah. was a big mistake. Yeah. We did. Yeah. But people remember what they... Anyway, that's why people didn't like it, I think. Uh, other people just didn't like it because nothing is perfect. A yeah. lot of people hate everything. Right. Uh, but we went off the air because HBO was changing. I mean, everybody that's there now that wasn't there when I w- was there. Right. It was just one of those... We big... got great ratings. Yeah. We got great ratings. It was a great show. But now, now you've... Now... What, City moment. One of the funniest yeah. things that happened on, on Lucky Louie to me was we were doing a scene and there was a woman who was a bartender and she had a shirt on and on the shirt was like the little clear tag that had like LLL like for long. Oh, yeah. And yeah, the, you know when it was from the gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, forget yes. to take those off the back of your leg. And and yes. We're rehearsing and, and Louie goes to me, all I want is for that to be shot and on television. <laughs> yeah. I was so bad. Yeah. And it was, I think. I don't think we had it taken off. I don't off. know if they took it off or they caught it, but you're like, I, I just don't want them to That's catch great. that. Yeah. I, want, I want her to have that on television. Oh, no. I love when uh, imperfect horrible. things happen. And awful things. <laughs> and I go, we're using that. It's easier to do on this show than Lucky Louie. There was some, uh, some level of people trying to perfect stuff all the time, and that used to make me irritated. Look, <laughs> look how easy it is to just pull. Lucky Louie. Yeah. Lucky, which obviously we did together. And yeah. One of my favorite projects I've ever done. I thought it, it yeah, was me too. really funny. Yeah. And it deserved mm-hmm. season two. It didn't happen. Yeah. No. What happened? What, like people, I say, why didn't Lucky Louie come back? And I, I don't know what to tell them because it's like, mm. well, I guess you get married to something and you feel like sometimes you think something's better than it was because we're close to it. Yeah. But enough people have said to me, like, what the fuck happened? Why didn't that right. come back? What was the reason they gave? I mean, it had a lot of viewers. Well, I, it did. It, it got more viewers than a, the, a lot of the shows that followed it. Um, never touched our ratings. Right. We had great ratings and um, they increased all the time. Yep. I used to get those reports all the time because I'm fascinated by the business part of television. I don't look at it like I'm not a person who's like, hey, man, I'm an artist. And uh, all those money guys can do what they want. (laughs) You know what I mean? I'm fucking fascinated by how people make money on TV and films. So I love looking at numbers and analyzing them. So I used to get the raw number reports from HBO. And they were always extremely positive. Like the only nights that our, our ratings increased every night, every week. And the only nights that they went down was because we were on Sunday nights. Whenever there was uh, big football nights, right. like in the playoffs, we would take a big hit. But so would the entire HBO Sunday night lineup. And our show would lose less than everybody else. We would lose less a percentage of our viewers than Entourage would. Like, Entourage was more boy-heavy. We had a more mixed audience. We were really a promising show for them. And uh, Surprisingly large black crowd, too. I've actually had black people, and very rarely in my yeah, career, they like it. love the show, yelling out the car window, yeah. Lucky Louie, it's ama- the fucking cast of The Wire used to watch uh, yeah. Lucky Louie. No, it never ends, either. People stop me on the street all the time. I get more recognition for that than anything else. And... Uh, the show really hit a chord with people. Yeah. It came at a weird time. It came when HBO was starting to change. Everybody, if you notice, everybody who worked at HBO when we did Lucky Louie is gone now. Every it's, one of them. It's the, it's the way that it's because I was attached to it. Everybody that <laughs> likes me dies. It, they just go away. You know what? I had that time. I had a time like that. That's a pretty good, when you look at a career, that's a pretty good, that's a good cusp time that you're starting to get at projects as they're dying. You know, like Ron Perlman described today, that he was on, he was on the last right. movie of franchises. And that's, that's a good sign that you're headed in the right direction, I think, honestly. But uh, HBO, uh, no, they, I thought we were coming back because they paid me and Mike Royce, my partner, uh, to hang around for it. Like, they gave us each like $100,000 just to not take other jobs. Right. Like, just th- threw money at us. We had Kim Hawthorne, who played the neighbor, the black yeah, neighbor. Yeah, yeah, she was great. She called me one day and said, uh, I got offered a pilot on a drama. I had no deal with Kim Hawthorne. She was really smart. She did our show as a day player. Like, nobody had made a deal with her, but she became, she played her way on the, the team. She was like a player, a rookie who has right. no contract, and the next year you got to pay big sure. money. She was so valuable to the show, and we had no deal with her, and she wanted to leave to, for a money for more money. And so I called HBO. This is when we heard the season four, one was finished. Yeah. And I called HBO and said, I don't want to lose Kim Hawthorne. So they just wrote her a check for $50,000. Just to keep her. Just to stay away from the other pilot, which is wasted money. 
we never made a season two. They hired, uh, they let me hire a bunch of writers. I replaced a lot of my writing staff with new writers, and they paid my writing staff to sit in a room and generate eight scripts. They bought eight scripts of that show that we we wrote eight new episodes that were paid for by HBO, and they floated the writing staff to uh, punch them up everything. Um, so I had every reason to think we were coming back. Uh, the reviews, everybody says it was panned, but other people will say it was critically acclaimed. Because if you actually go through the reviews, there were loads of great reviews. And most credible papers reviewed it well. The New York Times, L.A. Times, Tom Shales, all the Chicago papers, New York Daily News, uh, Village Voice, uh, tons of big papers loved the show. And then a whole shitload of bloggers and places. Like USA Today hated it. Um, TV Guide hated it, all those kind of people. Yeah, Entertainment Weekly, all those shits. Yeah, Entertainment Weekly shit all over it. And also, uh, you know, the, the one that bothered me the most, and it's like, and I, I do read negative press. You know, yeah, they I say we too. shouldn't. It's like, it's hard oh, not why to. Why not? Why wouldn't you? I Somebody know. Somebody writes a hateful thing about you and that's published, well, who the fuck are you not to read? Exactly. It? What kind of a fucking <laughs> Teflon person? doesn't sit down and read that shit. People just say that do. to take the sting out of the critics. They, they try yeah, to make the critics that's feel exactly not as right. important. It's always, I don't read my reviews. Yes, you Everyone fucking does. do. You're the first to read them. Linda Stassi from the Post annoyed me. Not, uh, people who thought it just wasn't funny. I don't like the writing. I don't like the acting. Right. Any of that's legit. Like You don't think mm -hmm. something's funny, you don't think it's funny. But when they started attacking the set design or the language, yeah. meanwhile, they didn't attack the language in the fucking, in, in the Sopranos no. or any of the other stuff. That's what started to drive me nuts because you knew it was something else. Well, you know, I don't look at anything as pure negative and I don't think, I don't expect candy like positive out of things. I knew that show was an experiment and I knew it was something to put out there and see how people react. And I loved every reaction, including Linda Stasi. Really? That I thought she was, it, it, she totally missed the point with the set. Yeah. Like she, I, me and Chris Albrecht, remember him? I love Chris. Chris Albrecht, the president of HBO at the time, he called me when we were laughing about some of the bad reviews. And he thought the funniest thing were people like her who made fun of how drab the set was. That it was an extremely calculated and deliberate thing to make the set really basic and 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 theatrical looking. That was a decision yeah. we made. And he thought it was funny that people like her would say the sets are so bad. He, and because he was saying like he wanted to call her and say, "You really think that we just missed the mark with the set? You, HBO, which has some of the most beautiful, opulent." Shows just fucking gorgeous set design. They're doing things about Queen Elizabeth, or whatever. I don't know all the things they were doing at the time, but on this show we just overlooked the set. Design. You really think like we hired a shitty set designer because we're not good yeah. producers? Like HBO would make a show like that without a reason. Um, so when she wrote that, so yeah, I didn't ever cared about that. I, I, but I was fascinated by it that some people just thought. And and other people that like Barbara Walters and all these people who said it was offensive because we're using bad language, where we were following a show, this show Entourage, which was I remember one of the episodes of Entourage that preceded us. They have a friend of theirs over who's a pri who just got out of prison, and he's anally fucking a girl like who doesn't look like she's enjoying it right. in one scene and you see his balls and she's fucking he's fucking this girl in the ass and they're rolling their eyes like there goes him again and that no one's ever says they're offended by entourage wow. nobody Sopranos HBO's crown jewel which is about a guy who murders people yep. every day and cheats on his wife every day here is our show we are a married couple faithful to each other, trying to give each other pleasure in bed. I'm trying to give her an orgasm to make her happy. And um, people like Barbara Walters called that offense. They were offended by that. But when you explain it like that, like you're, to me, one of your greatest gifts is your ability to logically explain. You have the greatest logic of, I think anybody I've ever spoken to. Explain like that. Yeah. Who can? How can anybody be offended after hearing that type of an explanation? Well, because you don't get to precede your shows with a soliloquy. That's about <laughs> the context. I really am a naive you know eight-year-old. I mean? You know what I mean? It's like every time I've edited, when you put together. But it's a good question because when you put together shows, whenever I've edited something with someone else, one of the reasons I love doing my show is that I edit it myself. Because when you edit with somebody and they're doing something that's not working. And you go, that's... Or when somebody shows me something of theirs, like if I have a friend who's doing a TV show and they show me a cut of it, 
And I go, I didn't, this part was confusing. I'm not getting that. And then they explain it to me. No, see, this is from before when he did the thing and that when I showed that. And I always say to them, well, as long as you're sitting next to every viewer <laughs> giving that explanation, then go ahead and cut it that way. But people take stuff in in this raw way. And most people don't really remember what they saw. And most people don't really take in. They take in about 60% of what they're watching. So I think it, the context of Lucky Louie was that no show looked like it. No one knew why the fuck we would make a show that looks like that. And no one had ever seen a show that had a basic three-camera family format where we would say cunt and fuck. That's um, too, by the way. I went back and forth with the critic because the laughs were so booming yes. that people thought, and this is one of the things I loved about you, is that you would never sweeten and you did not, uh, like a lot of times we would do a joke, it didn't work. Yeah. And you'd come to me and go, all right, what do you got? Let's try something else. We would try something else. Sometimes that would work. Sometimes it wouldn't. But you always left it. If the joke didn't get a nine, you left it as a six. You, yeah. you didn't so change. Those were be. real laughs. Well, a show is supposed to have a ebb and flow. Any scene in any show should have a quiet part, a loud part, explosions, parts where you come back a little bit. Um, it's like watching a baseball game. You're watching a game develop. You're watching the show, you know, you're watching a guy's at bat develop. You're watching him work the count to three and one, whatever it is. And then you know, wow, there's potential now because there's three and mm. one. Oh, fuck, he missed. So now we're now both, now it's even potential. You're watching this. And then when the guy hits a home run, it's a huge victory. Um, but the way people make TV now is that they just wanted to... I mean, what would it be like if every baseball game was just ho home runs? Right, right, right. Home runs, home runs. No, not even outs. Just till everybody gets tired and goes home. Yeah. It's boring. So to me, a show should have this natural feeling to it, which our show did. Our, it, it show, a scene would develop. Some parts would work. Some parts wouldn't. Some parts would explode, and it would mean something. Instead of this, every TV show now just has even exactly the same laugh for every joke. Ha, 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 ha. It's unwatchable to me. It's awful. But it is what TV has been. And had been when Lucky Louie came on, what was that, 2005? I, uh, it might have been six, or five or six. Yeah, it might have been five. So I'm going to say there was a good 25 years of TV made exactly the same way. Um, how the fuck do you beat that? I mean, how, how do you come on and not be seen as just a jarring, strange... And pe intelligent people didn't understand it. Intelligent people said, there's a laugh track. I mean, we even had... Uh, us saying, like in they, when they did in Happy Days, when Happy Days came on, there was a credibility problem for sitcoms because of the laugh track. They had overused the laugh track. So uh, Gary Marshall on on the uh, Three's, what do you call not Three's Company? Happy Days. Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. They had one of the characters say, "Happy Days was filmed before a live audience." They said it out loud. Yes. They didn't even print it. They said it out loud to make sure you knew that they're not fucking that these laughs are real. We did the same thing. We felt like we needed to do this. Pam same would thing. do it, right? Pam, Pam would do it. I did it. Did you ever do one? I, I never did, you did one. No. One. And then we did that, and people would fucking professional TV reviewers would watch the show, hear that with their ears, and they would write canned laughter. You know what's too, and this is what they didn't see is a lot of times before the show, you'd go out and talk to the audience, and I remember you saying something to the effect of don't. Laugh if you don't think it's funny. If you think it's funny, laugh. If you don't think it's funny, don't laugh. You really, you, you kind of told the crowd it was okay just to relax and react naturally, which to me just makes people feel comfortable to laugh. Well, I still say that when I... At least twice, with Pootie Tang and Lucky Louie. Yeah. There's a lot of people that enjoyed trashing that show. Yeah, they did, right? It was fucking irritating. There was people that attacked it unnecessarily. I remember after we were on the air for eight months... Mm-hmm. Um, we had weathered the storm. There was this feeling like we had our bad reviews, we had our good reviews, and with that information, the American public is deciding to watch the show. We we're going, we we're growing. And then a reviewer here in New York, David Abanksuli, scumbag. He didn't review the show. The Daily News, his paper, had reviewed it with another reviewer who said it, positive things yeah. about it. He didn't write a review and analyzing the show, which I think is what critical. Writing is supposed to be analysis of right of art. I think it's a legitimate field sure. to be an expert in television, watch TV shows, and then write an analysis. When you cr critics are supposed to do this, write what the show is, is like, describe it from a professional point of view. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not just a viewer, but here's the kind. This is what this show is. 
it, I don't think it works because of these reasons. Here's the historical context of it. It's much like this show, much like this other. Here's what I think they're trying to do. Here's where I think they fail. Right. But he didn't do that. He wrote one of these re- reviewers believe that they should be affecting how TV's made. And they think they, they should, you know, they like that power. So he wrote an article that the gist of it was HBO needs to cancel Lucky Louie, even though it only has four episodes left. And even though HBO doesn't need to cancel shows because they don't sell advertising, mm-hmm. if you have a show that's ratings are poor, the advertisers are losing money. So you have to cancel it before it's finished. Do you know what I mean? Sure. HBO is a subscription service, right. and it doesn't have a reason to cancel. There's by canceling a show. Um, and our reading ratings were increasing. So David Bianculli wrote, they should cancel the show to make a statement that they know this show is a mistake. And he put people's fucking jobs on the line. He doesn't, you know what I mean? If you don't like a show, that's one thing. And if you write and pr- trumpet your hatred for a show, you're welcome to do it. But there are people who like it. And there yeah. are people who are making it and it's their life. Like, it was just, to me, it was like a way overstepping. Like, who the fuck needs to read this? Didn't he get, he, he's not with the Daily News I don't anymore. know, I have no idea. I think he, I think, I think he was uh, fired or he be a guy who I'd read something else of his that I would, but he took this. No, I detest him. I, he I hope he's a lump somewhere. Reason to fucking write that, and and I wrote him an email telling him that I objected and then I erased it. I've done that a lot. Sure. I've written a lot of angry emails and erased them just as a way to get it out. But uh, right, something going to shit. And then I made Lucky Louie with Jim here, and Jim ruined it. And made it <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's funny, largely because of his. <laughs> they, they, s- they said that my outfits were really uh, were really the highlight of the show for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> same thing in every scene. Uh, yeah, and then that same thing that we didn't not do well with that show. Although it's left, it, it, again, you only end up with what you get. So there's people who love Lucky Louie. Sure, the people who hated it, they went away. They don't matter. But I would so, imagine it found a whole new audience after the all the success. Eh, a little bit, not so no? much. No, yeah, it's kind of did obscure, dead little thing. It's also not. I mean, I, I I learned a lot after it. Okay, but again, going on HBO when it was at its height. Yeah, and being their first. Really, their first failure after the Sopranos and all the shit they were doing. Like we were the first HBO can make a shitty thing. Well, that no, was the, a hard. Well, the critics really gave it a hard time. Yeah. The critics gave it a hard time. Yep. Um, I, I don't think they they were way too harsh on it, but they gave it a hard time, and it seemed like they, they they fed on each other. Like I would read a bad article about it, and then the next one was just a copy and paste from one guy. That's just, right. That's right. Which is the way you know you got that coming when you make something. Yeah. You got it coming. It's your fault. Right. Nobody asked you to make a fucking TV show. It's such a audacious asshole thing to do. So, <laughs> you know, whatever. But again, it, uh, that hurt really bad. Lucky Louie. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the hurt went away and I still wanted to work. So, But then Lucky Louie was, they let me do that show my own way. And it was closer to the bone. It was closer to what I was. Yeah. So I felt like I was able to kind of do what I was doing on stage in the show. And it looked like a guy sort of doing his act in front of other actors. But also, I started working with Pamela Adlon, who was yes. such a great comedy partner. I've learned acting isn't about you. It's about the person you're talking to. It's about the other person in the scene. So I think if Pamela hadn't been on that show, it, wouldn't, it just wouldn't have worked. And I wouldn't have been able to enjoy it. So that was good. I guess the difference between...